Good morning, everyone. Good morning to you all. Glad to see you here for morning worship today. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand if you would. Let's sing a song of gathering, a great song of praise to the Lord. I think everybody probably knows this one and has sung it before. So let's lift our hearts, lift our voices, and just rejoice in the goodness of God today. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. That's good. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. And the sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to see. Good morning and welcome to worship. Amanda and I were able to take off a few days this week and we've been enjoying the beautiful scenery and the wildlife of the mountains, but I've got to say, I think this is the most beautiful sight I've seen all week. And I've got to tell you, last Sunday, we joined in worship online. I'm so grateful we provide that live stream option. It's so good for those who are homebound, but it's the next best thing to being there. One of our members said, when I watch online, I can see you. When I'm there in the room, I can see you, see you and I can feel you. Well, last week I could see you, but I missed feeling you. And this morning, I can see you and I can feel you. And it's great to be together in worship. Now, as we know, we're welcoming many home from summer travels. Many have lost into summer travels this week. You see a little different look down front. Many of our worship ensemble are gone. In fact, Brock and Jen are enjoying a trip to New Zealand. If you get really hot, look at their pictures hiking the glaciers. It'll cool you off. And we wish them a safe trip. And Brock will be leading us in worship next Sunday. Rick and his family are away for about 10 days camping out west in the national parks. And we pray for their safe travel. But this morning, we're delighted to welcome David Huff. David is the former minister of music and executive pastor at First Baptist Lilburn, currently serving as our part-time financial accountant 
David has his wife June with him. David and June, welcome back to Wayuka this morning. Thanks for, for being here. David will be singing later during the offering. What a great day to be together, a great day to be uh, lifting our voice in praise. Our children will be coming in a few minutes after the children's moment to uh, play handbells for us. Your singing sounds mighty good. Let's continue as we join together in our call to worship and follow that by jubilant singing as we look forward to sharing good news on this beautiful day of worship. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship. Friends, let us worship God today, for God is great. God has blessed us with life, with faith, and with community. Let us worship God today, for God is good. God forgives us and encourages us and loves us. Let us worship God today. Because we are God's people, let us worship God. Let's do that together as we would stand. This is the hymn that probably everyone in this room knows. I remember the first time I heard this hymn. I was a much, much younger singer. And I was in the Omni, if you all, most of you remember the Omni. This was a big conference with multiplied thousands of people. I'll never forget what it sounded like when they sang this hymn. So we're going to try and emulate that today, all right? Redeemed how I love to proclaim. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child. Good morning. So, you know, this week, I um, started off my week on Monday talking with my son about Juneteenth. And he was giving me a little bit of a history lesson. And if you know West at all, you know he loves to talk about history. It's not one of my favorite subjects. And so as he was talking and, and sharing with me, he said, Mom, remember back in the days a long time ago, they didn't have the same ways to communicate like we do today. They would have to get on a horse and ride across the country to give information away. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, that got me to thinking this week about how communication has changed. At first, people would get on a horse and ride for days with a message. There was Morse code, telegraphs, trains, and just think about even for a while, there was a fax machine. Well, those are all kind of a little bit obsolete. And today, mostly we communicate with television, radio, cell phones, social media, computer, internet, and text messaging. Wow, communication has certainly changed, hasn't it? 
it is now so much easier, easier than when I grew up. So when I was about these kids' age and I wanted to send a message to my grandparents, I got a piece of paper out, I wrote them a letter, I put it in an envelope and I mailed it. It took usually four or five days for it to get up to Amarillo, Texas for my grandparents to read my note to them. Well, now, I don't think my kids have ever sent one time sent my parents a letter. Now they just pick up their cell phone and text my parents a message. And it gets there like that. Well, when you want to send a message, how do you communicate? Do you write a letter? Maybe you're familiar with a computer. Maybe you use your telephone. Just think of all of the ways that you can communicate. But for us as Christians, God's message, the good news about Jesus, it's never changed. Before Jesus was born, the good news of Jesus, God's son, was written about by the prophet Isaiah. And here's what was written. Behold, I send my messenger who will prepare your way before you. That messenger or the way it was communicated was through a man. And remember, his name was John the Baptist. And he told many people about the exciting news that Jesus was coming. Many, many people heard the message that Jesus was coming with the power to change people's lives with his love. John was a great messenger. And since Jesus' death and resurrection, we still share that news about Jesus with others. We can be the messenger, you and me, and we can find new ways to sell the same sweet good news message. I want to share that verse with you. I know many of you know it. It's from John 3, 16. For this is how, we, how God loved us, the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So today, that message is still with us. And it has not changed in over 2,000 years, no matter how we communicate it. And it reminds me that Jesus is love and that he loves us. So today, Kids Town wants to share with you and communicate with you about his love in a new way. So give us just a minute to get set. I sing the this song. such a blessing. Let's go ahead and stand again. This probably is my favorite hymn, probably true for many of you as well. You probably know most of these words by heart, so let's sing it to the Lord together. Oh Lord my God, when I
wonderful morning of worship. Lean in and listen as I read the words of Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 and 10 through 11. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me with a robe of his righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. If you'll join Eddie Rains with the invitation to the offering. Join me as we pray. Together we lift our hearts in praise to the Lord. For God is good and the author of good, new years. We commit our time, our talent, and treasure to support the work of God's kingdom in our community and around the world. As we give thanks for God's gifts to us, we invite you to give cheerfully and generously. 
Pray with me in unison this prayer. Gracious God, today we dedicate our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings for the advancement of our mission to us and through us. We covenant together to use these offerings wisely and creatively to share your love and grace with others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The offering today. I'm going to teach. I'm going to sing a song that's really so close to my heart. It may be new to many of you, and I'm going to teach it a chorus and get you to sing that last chorus with me. It's about the goodness of God, which is the theme today in the message. Good news, the goodness of God. And every one of us could give great testimony, I'm sure, of the evidence of His goodness in our lives because He's a good God. His goodness in my life started in kind of a unique way. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama in a Salvation Army home for unwed mothers. My unwed mom brought me there and checked in and and gave birth to me there. And six weeks or so later, the Huff family adopted me and took me to the other end of the state at Mobile where I grew up. And they were, it was a wonderful childhood. I was their only adopted child. My Mary Huff had had six miscarriages trying to have a child. So I was probably a little spoiled. Um, And then... God's goodness continued many years later, about 20, 25 years ago, um, through a long story of circumstances. I got to meet my birth mom and had a great relationship with her also until she passed away about a year ago. I got to meet all these aunts and uncles and just the wider family. I know that doesn't happen for everybody, but for me, it was just a reminder of the goodness of God. Um, He is trustworthy. He's wonderful. He loves us. And whatever our life situation, even in the tough times, his goodness never fails. And so you may have heard this song. I want to sing it for you and then back through the chorus and get you all to sing it. You can stay seated and just sing it with me. It's a, it's a great song. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head closer you're going to sing it with me in a minute and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness love your voice you have led me through the fire and in darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God try this with me now on the And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. And here's Psalm 23. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Because your goodness is running after, it's running after me. One last time on the chorus together. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see of the goodness of God. So true. God from 
if there was ever a time that we need to sing of the goodness of God, that time is now. Proverbs 25, 25 echoes the message of Isaiah 61. Like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. I'm not sure what it is exactly, but the past couple of years, cumulatively, it seems that there's just a lot more bad news in the air. And sometimes it gets on you. I've never thought of myself as the eternal optimist, but I haven't thought of myself as a destructive pessimist. I really think of myself as an optimistic realist. But even for those of us who are optimistic realists, there are times, I don't know, just a week or so ago, I felt like that, well, out of the blue, I felt like the bad news had just gotten on me and I needed a good news shower. You ever felt that way? You ever felt like it just sticks to you and it gets in your psyche and it gets in your soul? And yet, we're the people of good news going forward with all the exciting plans of fleshing out the vision God has given you here at Wyuka that all of us are embracing. As a healthy church, we want to be known in this community as a proprietor of good news. And let me tell you, there are a lot of churches out there that are not good news churches. As growing, healthy followers of Jesus, we want to be proclaimers of the good news. I'm not sure why it struck me as just an a, a extremely positive thing, but on our way back from the mountains this week, we stopped at one of our favorite little mountain restaurants, and they had gotten new t-shirts, and so I asked the waitress if she would turn around, and they had a slogan on their t-shirt, which aren't always that good in a restaurant, but she had a slogan that's brand new, speaks to their southern hospitality, and the little slogan said, our tea is sweet, words are long, days are warm, faith is strong. Uh, what a... Married to someone who loves sweet tea, that was a great t-shirt to, to have. But it somehow communicated good news in a sense of warm and welcoming hospitality. Well, good news has a way of lifting our spirits. Good news has a way of energizing our morale. Good news has a way of enriching our personal health. Isaiah 61, which Ashley read for us, speaks about the messenger of good news yet to come, the Messiah we now know as Jesus the Christ. Proverbs 25 highlights the refreshing and the revitalizing power of good news. And if we're going to live effectively in a bad news world, we have to be good news people. And good news has to be the dominant force in our life or the strongest among us will succumb to the bad news. There's so many things that are good news. In the ancient world, by the way, you didn't go to social media, you didn't turn on CNN or headline news. In the ancient world, good news or bad news was delivered by a herald or a messenger that would come across the countryside and it would usually come several days or even weeks late. Now we live in a world where good news or bad news can be instantaneous. It can even be saturating. I've tried to make a list of things that are good news this week, and the list is long. Let me share just a few little things with you that maybe are a little more relevant to us as a congregation. First of all, the Braves beat the Dodgers last night 5-3 to three at Truist Park. That's good news. But just as David shared his story, yesterday we received a message from one of our youth from our previous church in Kentucky who herself is now a mother and a grandmother. She was adopted at birth and her adopted mother died of cancer when she was a teenager. And after all these years, yesterday she was able to meet her natural brother for the first time. That's good news. One of the children that was born during my tenure in Alabama over where Mark has been serving as interim He's now a young professional, he's a contractor, respected builder, known for outstanding finish work. He drove from Jacksonville to North Alabama to help build a playhouse for a terminally ill young lady, a child, as part of her 
Make-A-Wish for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And it looked like a picture from a magazine. That's good news. It's good news that folks are able to travel again. Some have just returned from Ireland. Some are preparing to go to Germany. Some are out at Yellowstone this week. Others are down in New Zealand this week. Ashley and Jamila just returned from Jamaica. Some are going to Austria and Italy before the summer's over. It's great to be able to travel freely. That's good news. As a church, we decided we're going to sponsor refugees from Ukraine. We've been working with our missionaries, Gennady and Mina Podgaskaya, and they've connected us with a single adult female school teacher whose mom just died and their house was bombed. She has no place to return to. She wants to come to Atlanta to work. We have a family of five, parents, second grader, ninth grader, and a freshman at Mercer this year that we're getting. You'll hear more about that at the end of the service. You have an opportunity to participate in the sponsorship. That's exciting for me, for our congregation. That's good news. We're hosting our first community gathering this afternoon. We planned this over two years ago. And finally, we're getting together, inviting the community to join us. I hope you'll be there. I hope you'll invite your friends and neighbors. It's great to be able to fellowship and meet people and bring people together in an atmosphere of community building. That's good news. Earlier this spring, Angie and some of the ladies led us to adopt Cross Keys High School as our partner school. I've learned this morning that we have Cross Keys alums right here in the congregation. Just before we left on our trip, there was a delivery made to the church. Looks like a huge diamond. Isn't that a beautiful piece? And even shaped like a jewel. And it says, with gratitude from the faculty and staff at Cross Keys High School. Because Angie and our ladies prepared and delivered over 185 gifts to the faculty and staff. That's good news. And the best news of all is that God loves us more than we can imagine or comprehend. God forgives the best in us, brings out the best in us. God forgives the worst in us, brings out the best in us, and leads us to bring out the best in each other. Life is filled with good news, but we can't be dominated by the bad news. Billy Graham loved to say in his crusades, our chaotic, confused world has no greater need than to hear the message of good news from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which leads me to begin by saying the gospel is the ultimate good news. The word gospel itself literally means good news. Rachel Held Evans, a beloved author, who died so tragically so early in life, wrote, the good news is as epic as it gets, with universal theological implications, and yet the Bible tells it from the perspective of fishermen and farmers, pregnant ladies and squirmy kids. The story about the nature of God and God's relationship to humanity. She said it often smells like mud and manger hay and tastes like salt and wine, but it's good news. It's the biggest story and the smallest story all at once. The great quest for the one ring and the quiet friendship of Frodo and Sam on the journey of life. That line's found in her book, Slaying Giants, Walking on Water, and Learning to Love the Bible Again. Good news is anchored in grace, is grounded in love, and is underscored through the gift of God's forgiveness. Here's the challenge for the church. That's to keep the good news good. It's the challenge for every teacher, every pastor, and every congregation. Maybe you experienced this at some point in your life, or people said, let me share with you good news. You're a terrible sinner. You're going to rot in the pits of hell. That really sounds good. Well, there certainly is a message in Scripture that deals with the reality of human sin. But the overwhelming message of Scripture is not judgment, it is not condemnation, it's God's grace and it's God's forgiveness and it's good news. And a church that thrives in the future will be a church that keeps the good news good. And judgmental churches will have their place. 
but their ministry will be short-lived and likely ineffective. The ultimate good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, good news from all corners of the world has positive effects. It has positive effects on our mental, physical, and spiritual health. Good news in and of itself, it lowers our blood pressure. Good news uplifts the human spirit. Good news nurtures a healthy heart. Good news inspires excitement and enthusiasm. Good news motivates us to embrace new realities. One psychologist who comes from a background of faith wrote a wonderful column about the seven proven benefits of consuming good news. In that, these were seven benefits. Good news reduces stress and anxiety. Good news encourages people to stay more informed. Good news boosts mood and relationships. Good news creates greater engagement between individuals. Good news promotes optimism and increases heart health. Good news allows us to adapt more effectively to challenges. And seven, good news empowers people to give back to others. Now let's be clear. Bad news is a reality of life. Do not be dominated by it. Bad news is a harsh reality of life. You can't pretend it's not there. There is a kind of faith that's naive that believes you bury your head in the sand and just believe bad news does not exist. But followers of Jesus in the New Testament, Jesus never negated the fact there was bad news. He did not deny the destructive power of Caesar. He did not ignore the health dilemmas. He did not pass over the inequality, but he addressed the bad news by overshadowing it with good news and using the good news as a catalyst for addressing the bad news. Good news calls us to deal with the bad news without being consumed by it. I love what Tracy Morgan said. She said, bad news travels fast. Bad news travels at the speed of light, while good news travels like molasses. <laughs> Well, it's true in the world, isn't it? In fact, it's true that bad news sells better than good news. It's the reason it's incumbent on the church to be the primary proclaimer of the good news. One of the leading causes of depression in today's world is the bombardment of bad news. By playing the 24-hour news cycle on a loop, it numbs our discretionary faculties. It keeps us focused on what's wrong with the world without the counterbalance of what's right with the world. And that's what the good news is about, to counterbalance the bad news of depravity, to counterbalance the bad news of inequality, to address the bad news of poverty. Well, if bad news is a reality of life, if we can avoid being dominated by it, we learn to look for the good news within the bad news. If we believe that God works in all things to bring about good, as Romans 8, 28 says, then even when there's bad news, God is constantly at work through God's Spirit to bring about good news, even in the midst of bad news. That with every tragedy and every trial of life, there is a seed of good news that can sprout and become the next adventure of the future. God works in all things to bring about good. Be careful there. It doesn't say God causes all the bad things. It doesn't say God causes trauma, God causes tragedy, God causes disease. But it does indicate that whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, in the midst of chaos and challenge, that God is at work to bring about something good in the most difficult situation. By the way, Later in that passage of Romans, there's a verse that says in the King James, we are more than conquerors. The translation literally in Greek is we are more than overcomers. Let me explain. 
The word conquer has a couple of different meanings. One meaning is conquest. We have dominion. We're the best. We're going to conquer those we don't like. We're going to conquer the other side. We're going to win at all costs and we're going to gloat in our victory. That's one meaning of conqueror. The other meaning is that you stand at the foot of Mount Everest and you're looking at the mountain ahead and you want to conquer the mountain by stepping up to the plate and meeting the challenge. The word conqueror that's used in the King James and Romans 8 is not the word for conquest over other human beings. But it is the word for stepping up to the plate and seizing the challenge of whatever hurdles or obstacles are in your way. So the better translation is we are more than overcomers. We can overcome that obstacle through the power of Christ. We can overcome that hurdle through the power of God. Remember the bad news bears? Wasn't it great, by the way, to have our students playing for it? They did a great... I was, as they were playing, I was envisioning that six handbell players become nine, becomes 12. And then in a year or so, we'll be looking at 15 to 20 children playing handbells in front of that 40, 45 voice choir that's going to begin with 12 and grow to 20 and then 25. We're going to have adults playing handbells. They may not be as good as the children. <laughs> but those are the things that dreams and visions are made of. And it's good news. Remember the bad news bears? Their days when the optimistic realist in me looks in the mirror and sees a bad news bear. And yet as followers of Jesus, we're called to be good news bears. Nothing to do with Mercer or Baylor. We want our children to be good news bears. We want all of our ages to be good news bears. This week, let me ask you to do something. In a world gone topsy-turvy, in a world filled with toxicity, in a world that's divided, when pastors all across the country are preaching today to congregations that are divided in half over multitudes of issues, be a part of the good news conspiracy. Let the good news be what unites us. And let our diversity be what empowers us. This week, join the good news conspiracy be the one in your part of the world to highlight the good news. Remember how when we started, I mentioned in Isaiah and Proverbs, back in the ancient day, there was no social media, there was no 24-hour news channel. There was a herald or a messenger that was sent across the countryside. Well, as I read that, I thought about my Uncle Bert. He was actually my great uncle. He was married to my grandfather's sister. But he was an idol. He was the smallest man I ever knew with the biggest heart. And he worked for over 50 years as a delivery carrier for my hometown newspaper, the Aniston Star. Now before you tune out, let me tell you that when he started, he started as a little boy on foot till he got a bicycle. And according to him, when he started delivering the paper, he had a cloth bag slung over his shoulder, and rather than the papers roll like a scroll, they were folded in this triangle like a frisbee, so you could toss them up into the yard. And then when he got his bicycle, he put the bag on his bicycle, and he tossed the scroll newspaper into the yard. And then after he finished high school, the paper hired him full-time, and he had a little car, and when I knew him, he had a green station wagon. You could see him coming a mile away because you knew the news was on its way. And every morning between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m., he was delivering thousands of newspapers all over my hometown. And when he retired, they did a big write-up because everybody in Anniston knew little Burt Martin. Why that comes to mind is you and I are now the messenger. We are the herald. 
56 years, little Bert Martin, according to the Anderson Star, never missed a day of work. He was faithful. And I want to be that faithful, delivering the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news always invites a response. Even if we've heard it before, it invites us to open new quarters of our heart to its probing. It invites us to open new rooms in our mind to its inquiry. It invites us to open new dimensions of our soul to its grace. God loves us more than we can imagine or comprehend. And the good news really is that God loves us despite any sin we've ever committed. That God forgives the worst in us, brings out the best in us, and helps us bring out the best in each other. If you'd like to have a conversation about that kind of faith, or if you're looking for a church home, We'd love for you to join us here as we grow in faith and friendship at Wyuka. You can text the word join to the number on the screen. And one of our ministers will give you a call immediately following the service. Or if you've gathered with us for worship, one of our ministers will be at the front and rear of the Peach Fair Room following today's service. And we'd love to have a conversation with you about the good news and about your commitment to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. David's going to lead us in singing, a song celebrating our faith, a song that invites us to embrace the grace of God. As we conclude our time of worship, let's stand together and sing these words along with David. Sing this with me. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name. Thanks for being with us here on this Sunday morning, and for our guests and those online, we are grateful you were here as well. Before we go, here are a few opportunities and highlights for this week. First, as already been mentioned by Barry, we have our first of three community night events here at Wyuka, five to seven on the play field, and we have turned down the temperature just a bit for you today, so we hope you will join us. We will have food trucks. The food trucks are soul food, and we have a variety of things for you to choose from them. We will have uh, snow cones, and we will have a coffee truck. Uh, for those of you who haven't been in a moon bounce lately, you can moon bounce, you can slide. We'll have some games out there as well, and our Camp Wyuka staff will be there to help. We hope you will join us and be with us today from 5 to 7. $5 gets you access to all of the meals and all the food there. Invite a friend, invite a neighbor, please come join us. 
Wednesdays, why you could continue, we have our 1030 Bible study uh, that will continue to meet this Wednesday. And then in the evenings, we'll gather for a light meal at 530, followed by age-graded activities at 6. Uh, this past Wednesday is where the children learned how to play this song for us this morning. So I hope you'll have your kids come and adults come join us as we're doing some hands-on activities as well. Ladies Bible study will be on Thursday, June 30th, 1145 a.m. Again, Angie Durden is your contact for that. And Mom to Mom will also be coming up, uh, and that will be on Thursday, July 7th, and that'll be from 11.45 a.m. to 1. We have one final announcement, and I'm going to ask Jane Henley if she'll come on up and make that announcement for us. Well, I have some good news, Barry. Just want you to know, I woke up this morning with my home intact, no bombs falling from the sky, no soldiers marching in my streets. Our children were enjoying the summer camps or they were vacationing. We all know, however, that that is not happening for the people of Ukraine. But more good news. Wayuka has been given the opportunity to, um, to play a small part in helping the people in Ukraine who have lost their homes, their jobs, and left basically with nothing but the clothes on their back. We are able to sponsor a refugee family of five plus one teacher. And more good news, the church is able to financially do this. We are not asking for any individual help. Because of this first fruits from our development project, we had basically close to $9 million just drop in our lap. So we need to start using this money. And with that, the ch we did find out the church cannot itself sponsor the family. We cannot sign Church at Wayuka on the, on the applications. That's why we are looking for six or more individuals to sponsor these six people. They have to be individually sponsored. More than one person can sponsor an individual, but, but they have to be individually sponsored. Um, the church will be helping with the paperwork. We already have a committee set up to help work through the paperwork. There is no legal liability for anyone. Um, and the church will be covering the financials. We already have a committee putting a budget together of what it will cost to sponsor for two years. We just need people to be there when they arrive, make certain they fill out the appropriate paperwork and help them with um, the adjustment into this country. So if you're interested in this, please talk to me, Talitha Pettifor, Tim Robertson, or Amy Gibbs. I'll be here tonight at five o'clock because I'm gonna go down the slide <laughs> and I'm gonna get some other people to do it with me. So if there's any other questions, I'll be in the back to answer them or I'll be here tonight or you, my, you can email me or Talitha or Tim or Amy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, may we stand for our benediction and blessing and as you're standing, let me echo what Jane said. <clears throat> A couple of churches I've served in the past have sponsored refugees from Vietnam and from Korea. It's a great opportunity for our church to sponsor these six individuals. And the paperwork online is much like sponsoring an international student. You're basically signing that you'll make sure on behalf of the church their needs are being met. So if you're willing to be a sponsor, please see Jane, Talitha, Tim, or Amy to let them know of your willingness to sponsor. And we look forward, we hope maybe later this week or next to share with you names and even pictures of the families that will be here. And we hope we can expedite this and they'll be here within four to six weeks and we'll be able to introduce them here in the worship service. We look forward to seeing you at five this afternoon. Join me as we share our benediction. Our most gracious God is in the spirit of your unchanging love that we ask you to send us out to live the stories of faith we've heard this day. Help us to sing the faith we've received this day. Help us to share the grace that has touched us this day. Empower us to go and be beacons of your good news and to share the good news of your love and mercy. For we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Have a great afternoon. God bless you. Mm -hmm.